All right, open your Bibles, if you will, to uh, Mark chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 35 through 45. Today we're going to take that in two sections. Mark chapter 1, verses 35 through 45, and remember last week uh, we were talking about uh, a busy day in Galilee, and we were looking at what a day was like for Jesus as he was uh, beginning his earthly ministry, and he was he was beginning this ministry in Galilee, and and we, we kind of take, took a look at what that day looked like. And it was a busy day for Jesus, even into the night. And I want to just kind of go back and just remind us of what verse 32 and following says. Verse 32 of chapter 1 of Mark says, That evening at sundown they, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. So we saw that last time he had a busy day in Galilee, and, it, and it, that day went on long into the night. We can probably deduce from that section of Scripture that uh, that, that time of healing and, and that time of ministry went on into the night. And so, finally, when the day ended and Jesus got to lay it down for the night, you know, I got to thinking about this. And, you know, after a long day and it goes on into the night, we get home and we just, we finally are able to sit down. We're finally able to relax. We just want to be left alone. I know I do. I want to just be left alone and, and chill a little bit. And then, you know, who could blame him if he wanted to sleep in a little bit? I know I would, but not Jesus. Listen to what verse 35 says. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And so Jesus didn't sleep in the next morning. We see that he got up very early in the morning while it was still dark, and he got up for a specific, specific purpose. He got up for the purpose of spending some time alone with the Father. Now, this is one of Three specific times that Mark records for us is that Jesus went out at night to seek a place to be alone with his father. We see this instance here in Mark chapter 1, and then in Mark chapter 6, we see the time before he was walking on water. He spent some time alone with the father, and, and then, of course, in the Garden of Gethsemane in Mark chapter 14, he records for us that time when Jesus, right before the cross sought to be alone with the Father. You know, it's important that we spend time alone with the Father. Spurgeon said this. He said, Look no man in the face till thou hast seen the face of God. Speak thou with none till thou hast had speech with the Most High. It was important that Jesus, the Son of God, spent time alone with the Father. He prayed not because he was weak, but think about this. He prayed because he was strong, and the source of his strength was his relationship with God as Father. And so he felt it important, he felt it necessary to go out early in the morning before everybody got up, before it began again, and, and spent some time alone with his Father. And Mark tells us that he... He was looking for a desolate place. So, so he was looking for a place where he could be by himself. And I don't know about you, but do I have, you know, <laughs> this is going to seem strange, but my bathroom is my time alone. From the time my kids were little and now my grandkids, you don't bother me when I'm in the bathroom. I know women are a little different. I know that. My wife is always complaining. Well, the kids only, listen, you don't make them leave you alone. That's your time. And, and so from uh, when I can remember, 
And the time in the, <laughs> that's my time to be alone. That's my place to be alone. You know, we have to have that time. We have to have that, that place. I have a long drive up to work, and I enjoy that time in the morning. You know, that's time. Spend time with the Father. We, we have to find that place, and we have to find that time. Jesus did that, and he was looking for a desolate place. He was looking for a place where there was no interference. Again, Spurgeon says this, Secret prayer is the secret of prayer, the soul of prayer, the seal of prayer, and the strength of prayer. He says, if you do not pray alone, you do not pray at all. Your heart must speak with God in secret, or you have not prayed. Let us not miss the importance of this. When, when Jesus, you know, again, after a very, very busy day the day before that went on into the night of ministry, Jesus got up very early in the morning, Mark tells us, while it was still dark. And he got up for the purpose of finding a place where he could be by himself and spend time with his father. That's important for him. That's important for us. So let's take you know, a lesson from that and learn from that. We need to spend some time with the Father. We need to be alone with God. We need to have some time that we can converse with Him and we can read and study His Word and, and we can spend that time with Him. So when uh, the others woke up, probably long into the morning when the sun rose and, and everybody's starting to wake up, it, uh, Mark tells us that you know, Simon and those who were with him, when they woke up, they found that Jesus was missing. He was MIA. And so they, they started looking for him. And when, you know, think about this, and we can probably look at this, and I don't think it's a stretch to say that, again, there were large crowds that uh, were assembling near Peter's house. And, and they were assembling probably in the hopes that Jesus would continue his healing ministry from the previous day. So when they discovered that he wasn't there, they went looking for him. And when they found him, listen to what Simon said, everybody's looking for you. Where have you been? What's going on with you? <laughs> Not that, Lord, I hope you had a good night's rest. <laughs> you know, I hope you were able to just relax a little bit. I know you were busy the day before. No, everybody's looking for you. What's wrong with you? And, but notice Jesus replied. Well, be, even before we get to that, I want to point out something. Everyone is looking for you. Why were they looking for him? Were they looking for him because he had something important to say? Were they looking for him because they knew that he had the words of life? No, I don't think so. Just like the crowds, I think, in John chapter 6 who hoped for a free breakfast the morning after, um, you know, Jesus uh, fed the thousands, these, th this crowd had nothing more than a superficial self-interest in Jesus. They, they needed relief, and they wanted healing from their infirmities, which, when you think about it, is temporal. It was temporal. I understand, and, and we, we just did. We prayed. For healing, we pray for comfort. We pray for those that are sick, and we should do that, absolutely. But that's not the most important thing in life. The most important thing in life is salvation. Think about this. Jesus' ultimate purpose here and in our lives was not to deliver people from their temporal ailments, but rather to save them from their sin and eternal damnation in hell. That's why he came. That's his main purpose. Notice, you know, he. everybody's looking for you. And, and it's a good thing that Jesus wasn't a rock star preacher like we have today because he would have fed right into that. Oh, really? Well, let's go and, and see what they want. I mean, they're, I'm a popular guy. They want me. But I want you to notice something here. I want you to notice Jesus' response. Verse 38, and he said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that's why I came out. Uh, Luke records for us Jesus saying in Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man came to seek 
and to save that which was lost. His main mission was to seek out lost sinners and to call them to repentance through the preaching of the gospel. Not that his miracles weren't important. Think about this. While he was here on the earth and he did all of these miraculous things, and we're going to continue to read about those things. And as a matter of fact, here in a minute, we're going to talk about one specific. But, you know, those, those miracles validated his gospel message. They validated really who he is and who he claimed to be. But those miracles in and of themselves saved no one. Those miracles, those signs and wonders in his day and our day saved nobody. There are a lot of people that are searching after the signs and wonders. They, they, they wanted relief in that day and they're wanting relief. And again, I understand that. But that's not the most important thing. Those signs and wonders never have saved anybody. Salvation comes only, only when people respond in repentant faith to the gospel preaching. Jesus said, that's why I came out. When he preached throughout all Galilee, in their synagogues, and all over, his emphasis was on gospel proclamation. Paul would later write in Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 15, and then in verse 17, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Verse 17, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. If we're just searching and looking for the signs and wonders and we're looking for the miraculous, listen, there's nothing more miraculous than the preaching and the responding of the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the only way people can be saved. You know, I was thinking about this. In John chapter 11, it's the famous uh, situation where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Now, Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. And his sister, as Jesus is going out there, and he tells them to roll away the stone, she's like, oh, hang on a minute. You know, in, in the King James, he stinketh. You know, he's been there for four days, and he's beginning to rot, and he stinks. But Jesus went out, and we know what happened. He, he called forth, Lazarus, come forth, and he did. He raised up from the dead. But think about this. Lazarus had to die again. He had to die again. Even though Jesus raised him from the dead, he was raised to live so that he could die again. And had he not, and, and I, I think that it's not a stretch to believe that he trusted in the Lord for his salvation. When he died, he entered into heaven. But he had to die again. Our temporal healing doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to last forever. The only way that it's going to last forever is if we know Jesus as Lord and as Savior, if we've responded in faith to the gospel message. And Jesus said, and that's, he said, that's why I came out, to preach the gospel. And so he went throughout all Galilee preaching the gospel in their synagogues and casting out demons. Then in this next section, let's take a look at verses 40 through 45. And a leper came to him, imploring him and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him. And sent him away at once and said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places 
and people were coming to him from every quarter. So here, now we see this situation again where there's this guy with leprosy coming to him. Now, you know, leprosy in that day was a horrific disease, and it still is. Uh, you know, I'm told and I read there's, there's still some 15 million people across the globe, mostly in third world countries, that are still afflicted by this disease. And there are several types. It's a skin disease, and there are several types. And the most serious type is a devastating bacterial infection that disfigures a person's appearance and, and debilitates his nervous system and, and often leads to death. Now, Leviticus 13, um, that chapter tells us about what the requirements were. Um, 13 uh, verses 45 through 46 says this, the leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose. And he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean and he shall live alone. His dwelling shall live, be outside the camp. And so this was a dreaded disease. Now, Wearsby points something out, though. I thought this was very interesting. He says, when you read the tests for leprosy described in Leviticus chapter 13, he said, you can see how the disease is a picture of sin. Like sin, he says, leprosy is deeper than the skin, Leviticus 13.3. It spreads, Leviticus 13.5-8. It defiles and isolates, uh, verses 44-46, through 46, and it renders things fit only for the fire, Leviticus 13.47-46. through 49. And then, then he says this, he says, anyone who has never trusted the Savior is spiritually in worse shape than this man was physically. Man, that's, that's a good point. This man had this infectious disease. So along with the physical implications of this disease, this leper had also the emotional aspect to deal with. He, he had to live alone. He had to live outside of everybody else, interacting or touching no other human being. They, they lived out in these leprosy colonies outside of the cities. They weren't allowed to be around people. And so think about this. In light of the stigmas that were attached to this dreaded disease, and and. In, in, in light of the legalities of what he was permitted and not permitted to do, this leper came to Jesus in a public setting, and, and, and it was just shocking and amazing. Can you imagine what the people that were there? Because, again, there was always a large crowd around Jesus. Can you imagine what the other people were thinking when this, this guy... They, they see him coming. People start backing away. And he's not, he's not crying out. We don't read that he's crying out, unclean. He's just coming right up to Jesus. Can you imagine what the people that were there were thinking? This guy was driven by desperation. And so in spite of all the legalities attached to his disease, he made his way to the great physician. And he made his request. And notice what he says as he, he goes up, he, he come up to Jesus and he knelt in front of him. Man, don't miss that. He, was, he knelt down in front of the Lord Jesus. He knelt down in front of the great physician. And notice, what he, 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 notice the, re, the wording of his request. If you will, not if you can, but if you will, you can make me clean. The NIV puts it this way, if you're willing. So in other words, if it's your will, you can do this. You can make me clean. That's amazing. This guy displayed tremendous humility and displayed, you know, he understood 
he came, you know, he wasn't like the others that came clawing after Jesus. And they were following after him. He came and in humility, he knelt down before the Lord and he said, you can do this if it's your will. If you will, you can make me clean. And I think it's, I, I, again, I, the wording of this, he didn't say, you can heal me. He said, you can make me clean. Not only those that were sick with leprosy, but those that are sick with sin need to be cleansed. And Jesus is the only one that can cleanse. He's the only one. So this guy displayed humility in coming and kneeled down before the Lord and made this request. And notice Jesus' response. And again, think about the people that are around him. Think about what they... They knew the law. They know, knew that they were nobody was allowed to be around this guy, much less touch this guy. And Jesus stretched out his hand intentionally and touched this guy. Can you imagine what was going through the minds of the crowds at this point? This man had the audacity to come into the crowd. He had the audacity to come to Jesus but then Jesus had the audacity to stretch out his hand and touch this guy. And he said to him, I will. That's amazing. He said, Lord, if you will, you can. He said, I will be clean. He stretched out his hand. He touched him and he cleansed him. And you think about this, the infinite compassion of Christ was dramatically illustrated in that profound act of kindness. His love was such that he was willing to touch those whom no one else would even come near. He touched this untouchable man and said to him, I will be clean. And Mark tells us in verse 42, that word that he uses a lot, and immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. This healing, this cleansing was instantaneous and it was complete. You think about this. This guy who had come disfigured and defiled and despicable was instantly cleansed and disinfected right before their very eyes. But notice also that, you know, right up to this point, this guy does great. He's, he, he's coming in humility. He's coming in desperation. He understands that he needs Jesus. He understands that Jesus is the only one that can cleanse him, the only one that can help him. He's good up to this point. But notice the commands that Jesus give, gives him. You know, it's been said that the test of true faith is obedience. You can, you can tell where we are. You can tell where you are in your walk with the Lord by looking at your obedience to the word, by looking at your obedience to the Lord. Command number one, see that you say nothing to anyone. Well, why would Jesus ask or tell him that? Why would he sternly, he, he, he sternly tells him, See that you say nothing to anyone, possibly to prevent adding more fuel to the fire of the healing hysteria that was going on. He knew what was going to happen. So don't tell anybody. Just go out quietly and then command number two, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. Now we can read about this in Leviticus chapter 14. There's a whole list of things that needed to be done before being allowed or accepted back into society. He had to fulfill the requirements of the Mosaic law. So Jesus told him to go do this. Don't say anything to anybody. Just go out and show yourself to the priest and, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded. This guy was good up until this point. <laughs> but instead... Verse 45, 
But he went out and began to talk freely about it to spread the news. Man, had high hopes for this guy. He was doing good. He, he came in humility, all of these things. He was doing good up to this point. This is absolute disobedience. Absolute disobedience. He was so excited. Now, understandably, and, and, and again, Put yourself in that guy's place. This guy's been outside the camp. He's not been able to touch anybody, be around anybody, you know, and now instantaneously he's healed. He's cleansed. Understandably, he's so excited. He just wants to jump and he wants to tell everybody. But unfortunately, that's exactly what he did. That's not what Jesus told him to do. He was completely disobedient to what the Lord told him to do. He went out and told everybody. And this is an example of disobedience. He did exactly the opposite of what Jesus told him to do. And then the results of that, and again, the Lord knew and he understood that's why he charged him. That's why he told him, don't, don't tell anybody. And the results of that, Jesus could no longer openly enter the town. So again, this guy added to the frenzy. Just a side note, um, disobedience always has consequences. Always, always has consequences. Notice the picture here. Think about this. This guy, this leper started in the wilderness in isolation. And after meeting Jesus, he was able to mingle freely amongst the crowd. However, Jesus started in the city amongst the crowd, but after meeting with the leper, he was isolated to the wilderness. So in other words, in essence, Jesus traded places with this leper. Oh, wait a minute. That's the gospel message. Christ traded places with us. Paul records in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This great exchange took place on the cross of Calvary. Jesus took on our sin, paid the debt that we owe, took on the punishment that we deserve. The wrath of Almighty God was poured out on the Son of God in our place and we got the righteousness of Christ imputed to us, as Pastor Ron has been talking about. Jesus took this guy's place. He, they traded places. That's what the gospel message is all about. Jesus traded places with us. Wicked sinners who deserved the wrath of God being poured out on us. But instead, the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus in our place. He took our place. Think about this. Because of mankind's disobedience, he suffered. And because of his obedience, we are healed. Praise God for that. Amen. Let's pray. Father, once again, we thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you, Lord, for Mark's gospel as we're walking through this and we're seeing the things that Jesus said and did and we're reliving this and understanding more. Lord, grow us in this study. Help us to grow deeper, not only in our knowledge, but, Lord, in our relationship with you. And, Father, we'll be sure to give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.